Hey, everybody, who's glad to be at church? Anybody glad to be in God's house today? Can we just give him the best praise? Yeah. I'm thankful that you're here, glad you're in church, and, and to everybody who's on the other side of the camera today, too, we're glad you're with us wherever you're watching from, and especially our 430 service. I want to say thank you for making that your church home, the service that you go to. Thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing here. Come on, church like never before, can we just put our hands together for everybody on the other side today? Glad that you're part of us, that you're with us along, along for the ride, and Hey, how about this? Last Sunday, 19 people water baptized last Sunday at church. What an amazing thing that God is doing at church. I think uh, so far this year, over 320 people have said yes to Jesus Christ just from January to now. God's working. Come on. Do you know that today? God's moving. He's working in, a, in our city. I, I, I call it revival. I don't know what you call it, but I call it revival. Amen, everybody. So, uh, so yeah, we're, uh, we're in part two of a series that we're calling The Second Coming, Second Coming of Christ, and it's all based on this one thought that Jesus is coming again, right? He's coming back. And so last week we talked about how it's a love story, that it's not something we need to be afraid of if we're Christians, if we're believers. We don't need to be afraid of this. We don't need to worry about it. We don't need to live in fear because... We're, we're going on the first load, and we're going to talk about that today, but I want to tell you kind of how I got to this series. How did we end up doing this series? And, and really, it comes back to this, um, something I do a couple times a year, about three to four times a year. I try to get away for a couple of days, and I do what I call a prayer and planning retreat. And so I do it a couple times a year. And, and I'll just I'll do those two things. I pray and I plan. I pray about where we're headed, about what God's doing, try to hear his voice for the direction of our church, like what's next for us. Uh, but I also work on messages and I, I try to hear what he's saying for us, like what, what kind of content do, do I need to bring? What does our church need to hear? And I felt like coming out of last year into this year that, uh, that uh, we needed to focus on the basics of Christianity. Now, you know that every house has a foundation, right? Now, can you see the foundation? But what happens if you don't, if you don't have a foundation? It crumbles, right? And there, so there are some things in Christianity that are foundational that, honestly, I don't think the capital C, the big C church, has really talked about a lot. And I think we need to get back to those things. So that's why the first part of this year we've done series like uh, we kicked off the beginning of the year with a series called My Church. And we're not necessarily talking about yours and, and mine. We're talking about his. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. And he said the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against his church. And so that got us thinking, well, well if the gates of hell won't prevail against his church, we need to build his kind of church. Come on, somebody, right? We need to build his church. And then we did a series on, uh, on relationships, bi biblical marriage, biblical sexuality. We, we studied the Song of Solomon. For uh, I think it was four or five weeks we studied that. And then we did a series called The Holy Bible. And, and we decided in that series, you know what? We're going to build our lives on the Word of God. There's no other book in all of the world that we can build our lives on except the Word of God. Because it's foundational to us as Christians, right? So it's the Word of God. And so now we're doing this series called The Second Coming. And we're doing it because... We believe it's one of the tenets of the faith, one of the, the vital beliefs of the Christian faith that, that Jesus is coming again, all right? And if you're paying attention, you can see the signs of the times, as we call it. You can see the biblical prophecies being fulfilled. Any, anybody know what I'm talking about? Because Jesus said, in, in Matthew, he said, when you see the end is near, you're going to see wars and rumors of wars. Well, there's a war in Ukraine right now. And there's rumors of war between the U.S. and China and, and Russia and, and, and Middle Eastern countries that are aligning themselves with Russia and China. There's kingdoms rising against kingdoms, nations rising against nations. We just came out of a pandemic, and Jesus said, in the last days, there's going to be pestilences. There's going to be pandemics. There's going to be worldwide sickness in the last days. And so we just came out of that. And so if we're paying attention then we, could, we, we can see the signs of the times. We, we know that the end is near. So, so the Bible is about 30% prophecy. And of that prophecy, 
a big port, a big part of that 30% is end times prophecy, that Jesus is coming again, that, that we need to be paying attention to. And so, um, so the problem is that uh, a lot of times when you talk about end times, uh, it strikes fear in people. And, and they're, they're afraid, they're worried about the future, they're worried about what might be, what could happen. And so I just want to remind you that if you're a believer, you don't have to be afraid. Come on, somebody. You, it's, it's not the worst news, it's the best news for you if you're a believer. So, um, and I believe that because Jesus said so in John chapter 14. And there's a lot of imagery here in this passage of scripture that I'm not going to get to today. And, and I've, I've already been thinking, I might have to add a few weeks to this series because there's too much content to get through, all right? I just, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to teach on a little bit more if that's okay, because there's so much imagery here about what Jesus was saying and in a context that we don't understand in our culture, all right? But this is our theme verse for the series, and Jesus says, about the end times, about all that's going to happen, don't let your hearts be Trouble. Don't be afraid about it. Don't worry about this. You believe in God? Believe in me. Because my Father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going away? Would, would I lie to you, Jesus says? Would I lie and tell you I'm going to do something if I'm not going to do it? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, he says, I will come back. By the way, this is the rapture. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. All right? So this is, this is we're going to study a little bit more about this through the series, but it's our theme verse. And as you read that, I don't know about you, but I don't see a motivation based on uh, wrath and judgment and taking out the Antichrist. What I see is that Jesus wants to be with his bride. Jesus wants to be with his church. Does anybody else see that today? I see that. I see that when I read that. So last week we talked about why. Why is Jesus coming again? Today we're going to talk about what. What's going to happen in the book of Revelation. There's six big events we're going to talk about. Next week we're going to talk about how. How do we prepare for the second coming? How do we prepare for these end times that we're living in? And then the end, uh, or, or at least for right now, week number four is going to be the signs of the times. Like, how do we know? When is this going to happen? What are the signs that these things are going to happen? So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to give you the book of Revelation in about 30 minutes. All right? I'm going to attempt to give you the entire book of Revelation in the next 30 to 35 minutes, and I'm going to skip. I can't go into all the details because there's way too many of them, so I'm going to hit the high points, and I'm going to, I'm going to help you understand. I'm going to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. <laughs> Everybody gets cookies today. Everybody can understand what I'm talking about today. So um, before I do that, though, I'm going to tell a joke because I can tell we're, it's, we're a, little, a little uptight today. We need to laugh, okay? We need to laugh. So um, y'all know I'm from East Tennessee. Rocky Top country, like, like, I lo love, my, love my Tennessee Vols, right? I just, I grew up there, and in East Tennessee, where I grew up, it's not just part of the Bible Belt, it is the belt buckle of the Bible Belt. There's a church on every corner where I'm from, and so there's, there's these two churches, uh, Methodist and Baptist churches, that were across the street from each other, and one day the pastors were out, they were out holding signs, and, and the Baptist pastor, he's holding this sign that says, Turn or burn, turn or burn. And he's out there just, he's, he's giving every car that passes by, turn or burn. And then the Methodist pastor's across the street. He's saying, get right or get left, get right or get left. And, and this car comes by. They roll their windows down. These guys stick their head out the windows and say, leave us alone, you bunch of religious freaks, you bunch of fanatics, charismaniacs. Leave us alone. They peel off, screech off, and just a few seconds later, they hear screeching tires and a big crash. And they looked at each other. The pastors looked at each other and said, maybe we should have just said, the bridge is out. <laughs> maybe we should have just been a little bit more clear, all right? So, uh, so I'm thankful that God is clear for us. He gives us clear signs. He doesn't, he doesn't give them in crypto for us. He gives us clear signs. Aren't you thankful for that today? So... Uh, let's dig in. Let's look at it. Okay, so the book of Revelation uh, in the original Greek 
is titled Apocalypsis. That's the original name of the book of Revelation in Greek, Apocalypsis. It's where we get our word apocalypse. Uh, I was talking to a man after an earlier service who said that his, his wife is from Brazil, her Bible is in Portuguese, and the title of her book, Revelation, is Apocalypse, all right? And so um, it's, it's, a, it's where we get our word apocalypse as well, and it's, it's called that because the book of Revelation is apocalyptic in nature, and what that means is it's a, it, it's a type of Jewish literature that uses symbolic imagery to communicate hope, not fear, not worry, not anxiety, not depression. It's, this imagery is used to communicate hope that, that, that there is an ultimate triumph of God, everybody. That's what this book is really all about. And, and so the book of, of um, Revelation or uh, Apocalypse simply means an unveiling of truth. John was writing this book to unveil truth to us. He's saying, there's some things that I know that you don't know, so I want to help you understand. I want to help you know what this is all about. And I'm giving you hope in hard times. That's what the book of Revelation does. Hope gives us hope for hard times. So John is not a stranger to Jesus. John was an apostle for Jesus. He, he worked closely with Jesus for three years. At least he wrote the book of John. He wrote... First, second, and third John. He wrote the book of Revelation. He's often called John the Revelator. All right? And so, so he was close with Jesus. All of the other disciples and the apostles, they were preaching the gospel along with John all across uh, uh, Europe and Asia and the Middle East. And they were being arrested and even killed for their faith. And so they come to John and they try to kill John for his faith, for preaching the gospel, but he won't die. Literally, they cannot kill this guy, and so they exiled him to an island called Patmos where he was on the chain gang. He was working a rock quarry, and it's actually a beautiful island, by the way, but that, that's where they, they sent prisoners in those days, and he's on the chain gang, cracking rocks, and one day while he's there, he has a vision. He sees Jesus. Jesus appears to him in his glorified body. Now, Jesus has already ascended to heaven. So he comes down and visits with John in this moment. And the Bible says he has eyes of fire, hair like wool. He has a two-edged sword that's coming out of his mouth. And he has feet of bronze. And when John sees Jesus, he, he passes out. He, he faints. Jesus wakes him up. Hey, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Get back up. It's all going to be all right. And, and then for 21 chapters, John writes what he sees in this vision with Jesus. He writes it down and, and records it so that we could have it today, so that he could unveil the truth of the end times for us. And so there's six major events that happen in the book of Revelation. I'm going to give you the high points, and you can do some more study on your own. There's, there's resources you can use. You can, you can tune into a podcast called uh, Tipping Point by Jimmy Evans. It's a great podcast. There's Dr. David Jeremiah, who's a great resource as well, if you want to study more about this. But six things in the next 30 minutes or so, all right? So here we go. The first thing in your notes, the first big event is the church age, which we are living in right now. Okay, that's not the next thing that's going to happen. It's what's happening right now. So before anything else can happen, what's happening now in the church age has to happen. So the first two to three chapters of Revelation is the playbook for how we need to live in the end times. Because John is writing letters to seven churches. And, and he's giving these instruction, uh, instruction to these seven churches. He's, he's telling them they're doing good. Jesus is actually writing or telling him this. John's writing it down. He says, hey, you're doing good here, but you need to work on this. You need to repent of these things. And, and we're going to talk more about this next week. Okay, So I'm not even going to spend a lot of time here because we're going to come back to it next week to talk about how do we, how do we prepare for the end times based on the, the letters to these seven churches that Jesus gives, okay? So, so um, but, but he writes these, these seven letters telling them, hey, here's what we need to do. Here's how you need to live. The end is coming, so here's how you need to repent. Here, here's how you need to get right. And these letters were wrote, written to seven churches, but we believe that they are eternal in nature, 
We believe that they are written even to us today. Come on, somebody, because the rest of the Bible is written to us today. Okay, so it's something that we can learn and grow from every one of those, those letters. So not going to spend time here. We'll get to it next week. But, um, but the reason we're, we're going to talk about this is because most of the church isn't ready. In fact, Jesus said, and I'll probably talk about this one week, he said that about 50% of the church isn't ready. When he talked about the, the virgins, only half of them were ready, 50%. Of the, of, of the church won't be ready in the last days. And we know that 100% of the world isn't ready because they don't believe in Jesus because they're not, they, they haven't confessed him as Lord. And so we've got to be ready. By the way, that's why we give. It's why we serve. It's why we do outreaches. It's why we tithe. It's why we do what we do so that we can take the gospel locally to Wichita Falls, nationally through church planting, and take it all around the world telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. We do, that's why we do it. It's because we need to help people know Jesus is coming. All right, so... That's the age we're in now. We're going to talk more about that next week. But the next thing that's going to happen, next thing that's going to happen is what we call the rapture of the church. And this is in Revelation 4, verse 1. It's also in John 14. I believe that's what Jesus is talking about in John 14. He talks about it in 1 Thessalonians 4. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians, I believe it is. And here in Revelation for one, what's the rapture of the church, Pastor Ben? Well, it's when Jesus comes back for his bride before anything else happens. Before I talk about anything else today, he comes back for his bride to take them to heaven to be with him. So before the terrible stuff, before the tribulation, before anything else, before the Antichrist, Jesus comes back for his church. We see it in First. Thessalonians 4, he says that we're going to be caught up. And that Greek word for caught up is harpazo. It's suddenly snatched away. The, the Latin translation is, is rapture or rapturo, which means to be raptured, to be suddenly taken away. The church is going to be suddenly taken away. The believers in Jesus Christ will be suddenly raptured to heaven and that's not a scary day that's a blessed day come on somebody that's the best day for believers so so why do i believe that because revelation 4 1 says it this way that after this i looked and and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and the voice i heard speaking to me like a trumpet said come up here and m m many theologians so so what we believe as a church is, is what's called dispensationalist ter interpretation, okay? That is our stance on this. That's the churchy word for it, okay? And so that means that we believe we're going before the tribulation. Why do I believe that? So because this is a symbol of the rapture. Well, how do you know, Pastor Ben? Here, here's one way. Think about it this way. In the first three chapters of revelation the word church is mentioned 18 times after revelation 4 1 it's not mentioned again in the book of revelation why maybe the church is gone maybe they've been raptured and maybe john is now writing to those about the tribulation so think about it that way that we've been raptured that, that, that the word church isn't there because we ain't here the church that's why I titled the, today's message, The Church Has Left the Building. Come on, somebody. We, we ain't here anymore, all right? So, so think about it. The rapture. Jesus, uh, by the way, it's why we need to live being ready. Because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Paul says it this way to the Thessalonians. We need to be ready because about times and dates, we don't know. We don't know the date and the time. And we don't need to write to you about that because you know very well that the day of the Lord is going to come like a what? Thief in the night. I don't know if, if has any thief ever told you when they were going to steal from you? <laughs> Seven o'clock, I'll be there. <laughs> Nobody has ever, no thief has ever said, let us know the date or the time. They, they just do it on their time whenever they want to. And Jesus isn't a thief, by the way, but what he's saying here is... When you least expect it, when you're not counting on it to happen, 
He's going to come back. And that's why you have to be ready for his return, everybody. Because you're not going to have time to be ready for his return when he returns. You're not going to have time to drop to your knees and ask him for forgiveness and ask him to, oh, I believe in you now. You're not going to have time for that. He comes like a thief in the night. So he goes on. Paul says that while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape in that moment. The way Jesus writes about it in Matthew chapter 24, he says that it's going to be like this. The end times, the rapture, it's going to be like two men working in the field. One is taken, the other one is left. Two women are working, grinding meal. One is taken, the other one is left. Two people are going to be asleep in bed. One is taken, and the other one is left. That's the rapture of the church. And he says... But you, brothers and sisters. Now, who, who, who are brothers and sisters? It's believers. It's people who, who have faith in Jesus Christ, who have confessed him as Lord. We're not in darkness. Do you know why you're not in darkness? Because I'm telling you about it right now. So you're not in darkness anymore. You can't ever say, nobody ever told me. I, I didn't know. So I, I'm... Well, I'm not trying to keep you in the dark about this. I'm trying to help you know so that it doesn't come on you like a thief. So that you're prepared, so that you're ready when that day happens. For God did not appoint us believers to suffer wrath. So I'm, I'm, I'm escaping. I'm going on the rapture, everybody. But to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the next event that's going to happen is a rapture that we don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to take place. We don't know the date. We don't know the time, but we know the seasons. And, and the season is coming to, it's coming close, all right? So let me give you the next, the third thing, all right? So the, the next thing that happens after the tribute, is this helping anybody, by the way? I know it's kind of studious today, but I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to help you understand it. The next thing that happens after the rapture is... The tribulation. The tribulation. And this is the vast majority of the book of Revelation. Chapter 6 through 19 is all about the tribulation. And um, the tribulation is a seven-year period where the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. Seven-year period, and it starts with the revealing of the Antichrist. We don't know who the Antichrist is, but he will be revealed... After the rapture, before the tribulation, and I, I believe that he's going to be someone that is probably well known, maybe a politician, a world a world famous person, and he's going to broker a deal between Israel and the and uh, the Palestinians, so that there can be peace in Israel. In fact, the the Jewish people will be offering sacrifices again at their temple, which does not currently exist. They don't do sacrifices right now, haven't done them for many, many hundreds, thousands of years because they don't have a temple. So let me, let me help you understand this. Right now in Jerusalem, which is the city of God, God, the city of David, his chosen city, the temple mount where the temple used to be is not in control of Jewish people. It is under Muslim control. So if you see that that beautiful building, that beautiful temple that's on the Temple Mount right now, it's the, do uh, the Dome of the Rock, the gold, it has gold on top of it. You ever seen pictures of that? That is a, a, a Muslim mosque. It is under control of the Muslim people. Jewish people aren't even allowed on top of the Temple Mount. That's why they pray at the Wailing Wall because that's as close as they can get to the Temple of God. And right now, while I was in Israel last year, they told us that right now, preparations are already being made. Furniture is already being created. The utensils that were required for sacrifices in the old temple are already created. They're already in the works right now so that when they are allowed to start offering sacrifices again, all they have to do is pull the trigger and be ready to go. So, that, so that's already happening. Uh, one of the things they've been waiting for is a perfect, spotless red heifer which exists now. 
And so there's, we can't get into all of those details today, but the, what's going to happen is that the Antichrist is going to broker this deal, and three and a half years into the tribulation, he's going he's to change it all, and he's, he, all hell is going to break loose on earth, and it goes from tribulation to what's called the great tribulation, all right? And so, um, but here's the good news. We're not going to be here for it. <laughs> Believers aren't going to be here for it. True believers won't be here for this. Here's, here's why. Because in 2 Thessalonians, it says that the force that is holding back the Antichrist has to be removed from the earth. Do you know what that force is? It's us. It's the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is holding back the Antichrist, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of believers. So if we're raptured, he gone. Holy Spirit gone. He's not here to hold back the Antichrist anymore, and now he can move into power. In fact, in Revelation 3.10, Jesus writes to the faithful church, and he says that because you have kept my commands, because you, because you believe, because you, keep, you kept persevering, I will keep you from. The Greek translation is I will keep you out of. Not I will protect you in, I will keep you out of the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. We're not going to be here. That is a direct promise from God himself, from Jesus himself, that we're going to be gone, everybody. Come on, somebody. That's good news right there. The church is raptured when the tribulation happens. Now, when you read chapter 6 through 19, it can be really confusing because it's, it's kind of graphic. There's, there's a lot of metaphors. Remember, um, it's apocalyptic, so there's a lot of symbolic imagery in the book of Revelation. There's beasts. There's, there's dragons. There, there's eagles. There's all kinds of strange things that we don't necessarily understand. So put yourself in John's shoes. John is seeing the end of the world, perhaps, the way we're seeing it right now. So think about this. John has never seen what a helicopter looks like. John doesn't know what a bomber is. John, John has no idea what a submarine looks like. He doesn't know what a missile is or, or what nuclear warfare is. And so he's seeing this the way we see it today. We take it for granted because we see pictures of this every day of our lives. But he's seeing it the way we're seeing it, but he's trying to put, put it to words using language that's 2,000 years old. And I saw a dragon flying in the sky with, with fire coming out of his mouth. Imagine, you, you've, seen, you've seen fire in the sky before. It wasn't a dragon, it was, a, it was missiles. It was... Aircraft, right? And so put yourself in his shoes as you read the, the end times, chapter 6 through 19. So if you want to study that, it's in 6 through 19. If you want, if you're thinking, I'm not planning on being here for that, so just tell me what I need to read. Read the first three chapters <laughs> and then skip to chapter 19, okay? Uh, because that's when the second coming of Christ happens. At the end of the tribulation, all right? Um, and I want to be clear today and, and tell you that, that, that the rapture and the second coming are not the same thing. They're two different events. The rapture happens before the tribulation. The second coming of Jesus happens at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the battle of Armageddon, okay? So what's the difference between the rapture and the second coming? Let's talk about that. Um, there's a new movie that came out a few months ago called Jesus Revolution. Anybody seen Jesus Revolution? Man, what a powerful movie. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's awesome. I cried like through the whole thing. I saw it twice. <laughs> cried through the whole thing because I was praying, Lord, do it again. Send revival like that again to America. So um, the movie is, is, is loosely based on the life uh, of a true story of Pastor Greg Laurie, who pastors an incredible church in California. He was saved out of the Jesus movement. And here's what he says. Here's the difference that he would say is between the, the rapture and the second coming. All right, here's a couple thoughts. I think it's in your notes. Is that in the rapture, Jesus comes before judgment. He, he comes before 
the tribulation, before the judgment, but in the second coming, he returns with judgment. And we'll see that in just a moment. All right? And in the rapture, he comes as a thief in the night. The rest of the world's not going to see it because the church is raptured, but in the second coming, every eye will see him. Because he's on a white horse. All right? And, and, then, and then in the rapture, Jesus comes for his people. He comes back to get his people, but in the second coming, he returns, he returns with his people. We're going to be with him, and we're going to reign with Jesus, the Bible says, all right? So those are the differences there. One happens before the rapture. One happens after the tribulation. It's two different things, all right? So um, the second coming happens after the tribulation at the end of the battle of Armageddon. So what's going to happen in the valley of Megiddo in Israel? There's the nations of the world led by what many people believe led by Russia and many other uh, um, conspirators with Russia. They're, they're going to tie together. They're going to join together with Middle Eastern countries and they're going to descend on Israel to destroy Israel. You can read about that in, in Ezekiel. You see it in, in, um, in Revelation as well. And so at the, end, at the end of it all, Jesus swoops down. He's got fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. And he's riding a white horse across this land. He's calling out to you and me, will you ride with me? That's an old song I grew up on back in the day. It's called, it's called We Will Ride. We figure to ride. We're going to ride with Jesus. All right? Because it says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a, a man with a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true aren't you thankful that he's faithful and true come on you that's why Jesus said I'm not lying to you what do you think I would tell you one thing and change my mind why, why would I say I'm going away to prepare a place for you and then not do that he's faithful and true to do that and with justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that nobody knows the name. Only he himself knows this name. And he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Do you know what blood that is? It's his blood. It's the blood that he shed on the cross. Because the word of God says that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins you have to be washed in the blood of Jesus figuratively to be able to receive the cleansing from your sins and so his robes dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God well pastor I like Jesus I love Jesus but you, know, you just can't trust the Word of God then you don't like Jesus how can you say that because if you don't like Jesus you don't like it how can you love Jesus without loving his word? Because he is the word. He's the word of God. So you, you can't have a relationship with Jesus if you don't have a relationship with the word. And, and you can't have a relationship with the word and believe it without believing Jesus. He is the word. He's one and the same. He's the word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, talking about the angels. And some people believe as we're coming back with him could be us on these horses as well dressed in fine linen white and clean coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations who are attacking Israel and he will rule with them he will rule them with an iron scepter and he, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. It's the name King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Nobody like the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Who can, who's worthy to, to open up the scroll? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The Lamb of God. Who's worthy to come and defeat all of the armies in the battle of Armageddon? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Who's worthy to come back riding on a white horse with fire in his eyes and a sword? in his hand the king of kings and the lord of lords that's who's worthy to do it and and so jesus comes in at the at the end of the battle of armageddon he wipes out all of the enemy armies 
He brings us with him and we rule and we reign. He, he casts Satan into the lake of fire for a thousand years and we reign with him for what's called a thousand year lame, it's a, a, a thousand year reign. It's called the millennial reign. And there's more that you can read about after that. But the next big event after this, after the tribulation, after, after the second coming, is the great white throne judgment. Great white throne. All right? Pastor Ben, why is it called the great white throne of judgment? Because he saw a great white throne. That's the only reason I, I get. That I, that's the only thing I know. It's, it was a great white throne. But he saw him who was seated on it. Who was it? Jesus was seated, seated on the throne. And the earth and the heavens fled from his presence. And there, there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. This is, this is representative of every person who's ever lived on planet earth who did not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That they're... They're standing before the throne. Many theologians believe that Christians will have already been judged after the rapture. And this would be a judgment left for those who did not. The, the dead, the spiritually dead, standing before the throne, they're getting their day in court. All right? And, and the books were opened, but notice this. There was another book that was opened, which was the book of life. So there's multiple books that are going to be opened on this great white throne judgment. And you say, well, why is there multiple books? Why, why not just one book? Well, one book is called the Lamb's Book of Life. See, see that? The Book of Life. It's referring to the Lamb's Book of Life. And for every person who has ever accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, every person who's ever made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life, the moment you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. And what that means is, because your name is in the Lamb's book of life, that means that the, you have been bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. You're, 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 you're clean before Him in the name of Jesus. But what about the books? Why, why are there books? Well, the, the dead, the spiritually dead, they were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the book. See, here's, here's the thing. You, you have a choice today which way you're going to live your life. Out of which book? Are you, gonna, are you going to receive what Jesus did for you and let your name be written in the Lamb's book of life? Or are you going to try to pay for it on your own and be judged according to the books of your life? Every good, every bad deed, everything you've done, everything you've said, every action... Is that what you want or do you want, do you want your life to be judged according to whether your, your name is in the Lamb's book of life and you've been bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus? That's the great white throne judgment. But the last thing, the last thing there is, is, uh, is what we call the new heaven and the new earth after that and there's so many details in between that I can't give you all of it today it's just not not possible might be a great idea for a small group can do some deep dives into this this is Revelation 21 22 all right so you're deciding which way which book you're gonna live out of which one is your name gonna be written in which book are you gonna be found in and in, in the new heaven and new earth is the last big event that we see happen here and this is based on Revelation 21 verse 1 he says I, I've, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea that's gonna be a bad day for all of you who like to fish no more sea although it does say that the streams are teeming with life so you, st you still get to do it's just no sea apparently New heaven and new earth, and I love this, that Jesus says, or John says, I saw the one who was sitting on the throne, and he said, Jesus says, behold, I make all things new. He makes a new heaven and a new earth at the end 
the, the heaven is going to be different than it is now. I don't completely understand it, but we, we, we see that it has streets of gold. There's pearly gates. There are, there are incredible things. It's going to operate differently than it does right now. But there's a new earth too. What a lot of people believe is that he's going to recreate the earth the way that it was at the beginning in a Genesis 1 state. It was perfect. It was, there was, listen, there's no more crying in the new heaven and new earth. No more pain, no more death, no, no, no more sadness, no more sickness. Come on, somebody, the Krispy Kreme light is always on in, in the new heaven and the new earth. The hot light is always on. I love it. I love it. It's incredible to think about what the new heaven and the new earth is going gonna, is gonna to be like. And, and he's going to make all things new. Think about this. In the new heaven and the new earth, there's, there, there's every tribe, every nation, every tongue in the, in the new heaven and the new earth. You know what that means? No more racism. Pastor Ben, I just don't know if I can be up there with all those people. You won't be. You won't. <laughs> Attitude like that, we won't see you. I'm joking, but I'm serious too. I just, I, I think, I think God should be like, bro, you just get on out. It's like we don't have any room for you here. <laughs> so He makes all things new. And we live in such a tainted world, it's such a tainted place. But there's also beauty in the brokenness, right? There's beauty in, in the brokenness because that's where God's redemption shows up. It's kind of hard for Him to redeem something that's perfect. He redeems what's broken. He redeems what's not working. He, he redeems humanity that has fallen. And so I just want to take a moment. I just want to... I just want to remind you, you're choosing your destiny now. You're not choosing it when the rapture happens. You're not choosing it in the tribulation. You're choosing it now. Okay? And you have a choice whether you're going to live by the books or by the book. You have a choice. How are you going to, are you going to, are you going to let Jesus, are you going to receive what he did for you? Are you, are you going to receive the forgiveness of your sins, the the payment for your sins through what he did on the cross or are you going to do it your way you're going to take it on and try to try to do it your way you, you get to decide and i want to help you make that decision today and and truthfully i don't think fear-based decisions are good decisions so i don't want you to make a decision to follow jesus today because you're afraid so i honestly i don't think it'll work you need to make a decision to follow jesus because it's relationship because it's it's not on your heart to do so that you stay out of hell so that you get some fire insurance that's not a, that's not a great motive you need to make a decision to follow Jesus because you know beyond the shadow of a doubt he's calling your name today that he's speaking to your heart that you feel you feel the weight of your sin the weight of guilt the weight of your past the weight of all the stuff that you've done and you're saying man I want my name in the Lamb's book of life I, I, wanted, I want my life to look different I want to change the way that I'm living I want to be not just a better person but I want to be the follower of Christ that he created me to be but that comes with a decision, all right? So I want to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and let me lead you in that decision today. It's a decision of which book you want your name written in, the Lamb's Book of Life or the books. And so I want to remind you, He makes all things new. And I don't know why I feel so passionate about this today, but He can make you new. Today, He can make you new. He can make you new out of the ashes out of the junk, out of the muck, the mire, out of all of the junk of your life, the bad choices of your life, the sin of your life, all of the past, all of the weight of your sin, He can reach down today and make you brand new. And if you want that, if you feel the weight of that today, and you're ready to receive that, on the count of three, I want you to slip up your hand and let me lead you in a prayer. I'm not going to embarrass you. I won't call you to the front, but I'm just going to lead you in a prayer right now. If you'd say, that's me, one two, three. I'm ready to go all in today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Who else would say that's me, Ben? I'm ready to go all in. Anybody else? Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, 
18, 19. Anybody else would say that's me? I'm proud of every hand that's up, every one of you. Amen, amen. Come on, hands down. Let me lead you in this prayer. For every, every hand that was up, something. 18 to 20 hands. Let's, let's pray this. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Here I am in all my mess. Will you forgive me? Cleanse me. Wash me in your blood. Make me white as snow. Cleanse me from sin, impurities. Today, I make you a confession that you're my Lord. You're my Savior. I invite you to lead me, guide me, direct me. Be my Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, I will follow you the best that I know how. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.